Hi all, I'm Lauren, and today we're exploring the wild and wacky world of plants. Okay, okay, I know what you're thinking. Plants, wild and wacky? Lauren, you're crazy. Plants are boring. But that's where you're so wrong. Plants are incredible. Plants are part of the reason why we can survive on Earth. Plants are at the base of an ecosystem, like this rainforest here. An ecosystem is a community of plants, animals, and microbes which function together in order to survive. And plants are the foundation for these systems. They're responsible for harnessing the sun's energy and providing that energy to the microbes and animals in the form of food. Plants are responsible for removing carbon dioxide, a potentially harmful greenhouse gas from the atmosphere, and replacing it with oxygen. They're literally part of the reason why we can breathe. <sighs> and the craziest thing about plants? They can make their own food. By combining water from the roots, carbon dioxide from the air, and using energy that is stored in sunlight, plants can create sugars and release oxygen in a process called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis allows plants to make sugars, and this serves as an energy source so that plants can perform all the functions that they need to survive. Photosynthesis is probably one of the most important functions of plants, so let's look more closely at how this process works. So in order to better understand photosynthesis, we have to shrink ourselves down and look at plants on the cellular level. And there are three very big differences between a plant cell and an animal cell like this one. The first difference is that plants, along with their cell membrane, have a cell wall, which animal cells don't. They only have a cell membrane. And this cell wall is responsible for giving this plant cell structure. It keeps it stiff, and that ultimately is what allows plants to grow strong and be tall. The second difference between animal cells and plant cells is the presence of this vacuole structure here. The vacuole structure, which is only present in plant cells, stores water, and it can expand and shrink depending on how much water is available to the plant. And then the third biggest difference is the fact that plant cells have an organelle called the chloroplast, which is absent in animal cells. And inside this chloroplast is a molecule called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a pigment, it's a green pigment. So not only is it responsible for giving plants their green color, but it is actually what converts light energy into chemical energy. And this chemical energy can then be used to perform photosynthesis and make sugars for the plants to survive. So another question that arises with photosynthesis is how are plants capable of moving water, which is in the roots, all the way to the tips of these plants where photosynthesis occurs? And then, after photosynthesis, when you've made all these sugars, how do the sugars get transported from the tip to wherever they need to go for this plant to function? Well, that's where xylem and phloem come in. So xylem and phloem are a vascular system. So just like animals have a vascular system, a way of transporting nutrients through the body, so do plants. Animals have veins and arteries. Plants have xylem and phloem. So xylem is responsible for moving water from the roots to the tips of plants where photosynthesis occurs. And phloem moves sugars to sink tissues, places where either the sugars will be stored or used for energy to perform specific functions. Once we understand photosynthesis, we can start to see why plants don't have to move around, unlike animals. Because plants can create their own food, they don't have to move in search of a food source. And their xylem ensures that water comes to the plant, while phloem enables sugars to be sent to the correct places inside the plant. But despite the fact that plants are fairly stationary, they have a lot of ways of getting around the fact that their roots are stuck in the ground. So for instance, all plants are capable of moving toward or away from a light source in a process called phototropism. So usually what happens is that the shoots or the portions that are above ground experience positive tropism and they'll move towards the light, whereas the roots experience negative phototropism and they'll move away from the light. So see, plants can actually use light as a directional cue for which way to move and grow. Sunflowers are a great example of phototropism in action. See, when a sunflower bud has formed, it will perform phototropism and follow the sun from east to west throughout the day. However, as soon as the flower blooms, the plant becomes stationary and phototropism of the flowers no longer occurs. 
So it's actually a common misconception that sunflowers follow the sun from day to day. However, the leaves will constantly perform phototropism for the entire lifetime of this plant, always following the sun so that it can make photosynthesis at the maximum level, which ultimately allows this plant to meet the energy demands it takes to make these seeds that you see in the middle of the flower. Plants have also come up with all sorts of crazy ways to make sure that their seeds move around too, so that plants can spread and grow in the environment. Some trees, like this box elder tree here, actually put little tiny wings on the seeds so that they can be carried off on windy days. Some plants grow fruit, like this banana. This will attract animals that eat the fruit and the seeds that are stored inside. After passing through the digestive tract, these seeds will be deposited far, far away from the parent plant. In fact, some seeds are so t strong that they have to pass through an animal's stomach in order to soften enough so that the seed can germinate or send out that little green shoot that will become the parent plant. And just like animals, some plants have to mate in order for a seed to become fertilized to grow a new plant. Flowers are designed to attract pollinating insects like this sphinx moth or bumblebees. When these creatures eat the sweet nectar provided by the flower, they get covered in pollen and this can spread to other flowers. This pollen can then fertilize the egg of plants and now a new plant can grow. Plants can also talk to each other. Yes, you heard me correctly, plants can communicate. Let's look at the broad bean plant to see how this works. So everyone knows that bugs love plants. Aphids especially are every gardener's worst nightmare coming to wreak havoc on the fruits of their lab labors. But plants aren't just passive bystanders at this buffet. See, when the broad bean plant senses that it's being eaten, it will release a smelly chemical called a volatile organic compound, or VOC for short. And this VOC signals to neighboring bean plants to create a second VOC. And this VOC, it not only repels aphids and prevents them from eating the plant, but it also attracts aphid-eating wasps. So a two-in-one punch, if you will, to prevent predation. Understanding plant communication is a relatively new research topic in botany. And while scientists still have a lot to learn about how plants can communicate and interact with each other, they're finding that many plants are actually capable of interacting with each other. In fact, it's, scientists even hypothesize that the smell of fresh cut grass is actually a stress signal sent out to warn other grasses of their impending haircut. Woody plants that have bark, like trees for instance, can also communicate to humans about environmental changes. So you're probably familiar with the idea of tree rings, right? And you know that each tree ring corresponds to a year. So you can actually count the number of rings in a tree and know how old that tree was. But what's really cool is that the thickness of the rings can actually give scientists hints about environmental changes over this tree's lifetime. So for instance, a tree will grow more if more water is available, and so that will make the ring thicker. And by measuring the thickness of rings, scientists can actually determine how much rainfall an area received each year, and this can tell us about changes in our climate over time. So from all the information we've learned today, we can see that plants are pretty amazing. They provide oxygen to breathe, but also food for us animals who aren't capable of performing photosynthesis. And because plants can't move, they've come up with ways of spreading their seeds, following the sun, and even communicating with each other. And the really awesome thing about plants, like this tree here, is they can provide scientists with clues from the past so that we can learn more about climate change. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Backyard Biology. And remember, biology is all around you. It might even be providing you with some shade on a hot day like today. See you soon.